I'm so excited that we actually have an AIA lecture, even mm -hmm. under these incredible circumstances. So, um, and I hope that my colleagues, Rob Chinolt, can actually take over and introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, yeah, I am. I'm happy to do that. Um, so I know probably there'll be still a few uh, filtering in, and um, that's fine. I'll just uh, welcome everyone to our, our first archaeology lecture of the spring semester. Um, I will um, maybe I should just uh, say at the outset, um, if everyone could please uh, be sure their microphones are muted, uh, just to minimize distractions and background noise. There will be a chance to ask uh, questions at the end of the lecture. Uh, it's nice to see at least some uh, familiar faces and names uh, despite our having to uh, resort to this um, different format. Um, due to the ongoing uh, pandemic, our, our campus remains closed to visitors, but our chapter um, wanted to maintain at least a limited schedule of talks this year. Uh, there will be one other talk this semester uh, scheduled for early April on the subject of ancient Roman gardens. Um, tonight, we extend a, a warm digital welcome, uh, much delayed, uh, to Professor Doug Bamforth, who was originally scheduled to deliver this talk in person last April. Uh, it has been a, a long 10 months uh, in, in all senses of the word. Um, Doug is a professor of anthropology at the University of Colorado Boulder and a leading expert on the archaeology of the Great Plains. His many journal articles and book chapters are too numerous to list, but members of the audience may want to keep an eye out for his forthcoming book, An Archaeological History of the Great Plains, expected from Cambridge University Press later in 2021. Doug has a long record of work on uh, the Paleo-Indian period on the plains, in which his research has focused on how human use of the plains landscape responded to long-term environmental change uh, during the Paleo-Indian period from roughly 11,000 to 8,000 uh, BC. More recently, his research has turned to later periods of time, particularly the Plains Village period, looking at the archaeology of farmers on the central and northern plains during the last thousand years. His fieldwork over the last half dozen years has focused on a small scale uh, 12th century horticultural community on the Pine Ridge in northwestern Nebraska, and we are fortunate tonight to hear some of the results of this work in his talk titled The King Site in Western Nebraska and Maize Horticulture Beyond the 100th Meridian. So I will turn it over to Doug. April notes. Thank you. Make it go away. There we go. Thank you very much. I, I had said when we were chatting before that this is this is both my first AIA circuit, sort of circuit, and my very first AIA lecture. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm excited. And I looked up um, Doris Stone. This is a Stone lecture, and it turns out that, that she both was she was associated with Tulane, where my uncle taught um, in the biology department for decades. So I suspect she knows my knew my family, and. Uh, she also worked down in the intermediate area where, with one of my, where one of my colleagues is one of the few American archaeologists, Jason Sheets, who works down there. So it's this strange small world that we live in with these connections that I never would have anticipated. Um, and then a reminder that the lecture is being recorded, which I think is great. So I'm going to talk about a very small place. Um, uh, it's called the King site out in the northwestern corner of Nebraska. And I think that any archaeological site has implications that go that are bigger, that are much bigger. And I want to start off with a much bigger question that I'm going to argue the, the King site tells us something about. And it's one of the, I think, one of the fundamental questions in archaeology in general. We talk about a handful of big questions, big problems. And one of them is, is how did where does food domestication come from? Why are why are we not no longer hunters and gatherers? And we see maps like this all the time. And and this, this map really shows us two things, right? It shows us this very small number of places where people invented agriculture, and then it shows agriculture um, spreading all over the rest of the world. And that's uh, what I want to talk about. It's not that not that tiny number of events of invention, but but the the far more universal process of transformation that followed on from that. 
and I, what we know about this in general at a global sense is, you know, a map like this demonstrates at the end of the ice age, everyone was a hunter and gatherer. And today, no one's a hunter and gatherer. And that, that tells us a couple of things. The long-term food production always replaces hunting and gathering. There are no exceptions. Um, food production doesn't always replace hunting and gathering immediately, though. There's a period of, there's often, it, it goes in fits and starts, and there's often a period of overlap and interaction. And and that means, um, taken together, what that means is that except for a really small number of first inventions, about maybe eight to 10, um, turning to food production always involves knowledgeable choice. It always involves people who understood what they were getting into. And the mystery of the invention of food production is, is very much that, that people didn't know what they were getting into. But that's not what happened after it was around, because you could see it down the road or across the river or wherever it was coming from. Um, and that's that. I, I want that to kind of frame the case that, that we're going to talk about. And I want to talk about the Great Plains, about my turf, um, the huge grassland in the, the central central part of, of North American continent. And we'll look. I think you guys can see. We'll end up up in here. Um, we of course, the Great Plains is known for hunters and gatherers. I'm sure most of you have seen Dances with Wolves. Um, Right? The good guys in Dances with Wolves are the Lakotas who live this kind of a way of life. And this is a colonial era way of life, right? Horses came in with the Spanish. Um, but, but intensive bison hunting has deep, deep roots on the Great Plains. And, and this is, I mean, for a lot of people, this is what Native Americans look like, and it, which is not the case in, um, through most of North America, obviously, and, is cert and was not the case on the Great Plains. In fact, the largest, no, for the last thousand years, the largest number of people who lived on the Great Plains were not hunters and gatherers, they were farmers. And they lived in big towns by the 1700s, like Double Ditch up in North Dakota, which as the magnetics show you on the left, um, is actually Quadruple Ditch. And these were towns of a thousand or two thousand people, Earth Lodge villages like the one George Catton um, painted down in the lower right. And towns like this that housed hundreds and thousands of people in some cases um, extended from North Dakota all the way down into eastern Kansas with this kind of architecture and well south of there um, with a very different kind of an architecture. These folks knew each other, right? These were not, these two groups lived side by side, but they lived side by side in the 1800s and the 1700s, and they lived side by side for a thousand years, right? This is the problem. That is, they, people made a choice about what they were going to live, how they were going to live. They could have been a farmer and they weren't, but they knew their neighbors and they were locked together, woven together into this network of trade that tied the entire Great Plains together. And in fact, tied most of North America together. And we can see that in objects and we can see that in, in written records when we get into the colonial era. And the, the most famous part of this is the Plains-Pueblo interaction that Coronado described in 1541, 1542, um, at Pecos Pueblo and some of the other front border Pueblos, but it happened all over. That was one example of something that happened all over the place, right? These are knowledgeable people who, has, who understood their neighbors and knew their ways of life. And I wanna add, I wanna use one more Plains example before we talk about the King site to add a little bit to, to that, to this, right? It's knowledgeable choice, inevitable change, but not always, you know, but, but it changed where people were side by side for many cases. In, from, in most cases. This is a Comanche um, town, Comanche village that Catlin painted. And I wanna look at, at um, one particular Comanche. This is Quanah Parker. Quanah Parker was the last great leader of the Comanche, sort of never a formal chief, in, but from in Comanche terms, although sort of appointed chief by the, by the government um, somewhat later. But, but he was, a war leader and a hunter gatherer. He was a bison hunter. And this is him with one of, he actually had many wives. He had an astonishing number of wives actually. But Tenarse was, was one of his favorite wives. I'm not sure. Um, but these are hunters and gatherers. These were bison hunters. And you can see that in his architecture and you can see that in, in the kind of clothes that he wears. And if we can see more of his material culture, you could, you could see that in his material culture, right? Um, these are not hunters and gatherers, right? These are farmers. Um, they're equally serious people, right? There is no question about this. Um, but these are sort of diametrically opposed ways of life. And you can see that in their clothing and you can see that in their architecture and you can see that in their technology, just as we could see it for Quanah Parker and Tanarsi. Um, and we see these, right? This is, this is hunting and gathering and, and fruit production. Except that this is Quanah Parker and Tanarsi too. 
in 1870, Quanah might have, might have driven, um, dressed something like that. Um, in 1900, he dressed like this. And he was said to be the wealthiest Native American in North America at that time. He was a very successful rancher in southwestern Oklahoma. And the house that you see here is on the National Register of Historic Places. You can visit it today. Um, he transformed his life in the, in the blink of an eye in the blink of an eye in less than a generation. And that means that these changes can, can happen really fast. But what I wanna to add to that list of three things is not just that, that it can take some time, it can be slower, it can be fast in the case of, of someone like him, but that it, it's always enmeshed in a much larger web of social and economic and political connections. That doesn't mean it has to be forcible in the sense of the, of the colonial era in North America, but the choices that local people, including very local, what we think of as very local hunter-gatherer groups make are choices that, that they make because for reasons that are, that are immediate in their lives. You know, how do I feed my family? What's available to me in the place where I am? But they're also choices that they make in connection to, to their connections and their interactions with the regions over often a much larger area around them. And, and that's, I wanna dive down into a very small place and we're gonna come back up and I think, and try to talk about it in, in those terms again. And I want to keep this as a kind of a frame around it. Now, Plains archeologists have been keenly aware of, of this variability and we're, we tend to be a, a practical minded um, material kind of bunch and, and people have noticed that where we see farmers is on the eastern parts of the plains and where we see hunter gatherers is in the western part of the plains. It's, it's blurrier than this in the deeper past. But the great, great plains archaeologist Waldo Wedel um, showed, you know, argued that, that in fact, depending on who you read, the 100th meridian, the 99th meridian, 100th is a nice round number, so that's the one that most people use. Um, put farmers on the, to the east of, of the 100th meridian, hunter-gatherers to the west, you know, feed caps to the east, cowboy hats to the west, right? It, it's a dividing line, and it's a dividing line that has to do with, with substantially with precipitation. There, you, you can, on average, you get enough rain to the east to bring in a dry land crop of maize and corn. Um, on average, to the west, you don't. And, and that pattern is something that Wedel talked about. Um, he knew it was blurry, but that has been something that, that comes right down to the present. That I, just, I found an article about the, either the 100th or the 99th meridian published just a year or two ago, saying that, in fact, you can see the meridian from in, from in aerial photographs, in, in satellite photographs, because of the, the differences. And it's browner to the west and it's greener to the east. We're going to go way out here. We're going to go well west of the 100th meridian. And I'm going to argue that there, I'm going to show that there were farmers out there. They're not the same as the farmers that I mentioned in those big towns. Those big towns were things, were communities that on the, on the central Great Plains in Nebraska and Kansas did not develop until about 1500. They were little, towns of that size were older um, up in the Dakotas. But what we see instead is, said instead is a different kind of maize farmer. They're called the Central Plains tradition, and archaeologists have, have seen these sites since the er, very early 20th century. They've published an American anthropologist in other places in 1907 and 1909, uh, and it's a really distinctive archaeology. You can see it in architecture, like that upper left-hand hand picture. So they these almost square houses, sometimes dug down into the ground a little bit, sometimes like these, right on, a, on the ground surface. There's four center posts and this extended entryway. There's a fireplace right here. I'm assuming that you can all see my, cur my cursor. Um, and not those big towns, but these smaller scatters of a few houses. And it's almost certain that these houses are not contemporary with one another. You often find all the trash thrown into this house, for example, um, probably by the neighbors in these other houses. So instead of these giant aggregated communities of hundreds and hundreds of people, what we, what we saw in the Central Plains tradition are these scattered homesteads across Nebraska, and most of Nebraska and Kansas, growing maize, right? The, it's, there's no question about this. Storage pits here, they were laying in um, food stores and seed corn and that kind of thing. Not that big. There's a, an undergraduate sitting up here um, as, for scale. Very characteristic, if not very ornate pottery. It's easy to recognize in this kind of restricted orifice. The, closed in neck with a collar around the edge and sometimes and sometimes not, but this kind of globular pottery is quite characteristic, cord marked on the outside. 
bison scapula hose were, the, were primary gardening tools. Um, very characteristic aspects of some of their stone technology, these, what they're called diamond bevel knives. They start off looking something like this, and as they're resharpened over and over again, they take on this characteristic diamond shape like the one here, side notched arrowheads with characteristic um, projectile point people used. This, um, again, the gardening tools made out of bison bone. Now, they appeared, this way of life appeared um, based on maize with, with this, basically this full set of archaeology in the late 1100s and in a very set of isolated areas around Kansas City, um, into northeastern Kansas and a few places and possibly over into southwestern Nebraska. And then it kind of stayed there and they were, sur they were still surrounded by people who were generalist kinds of hunters and gatherers. And then it exploded across the great, the central plains in the, in the 1200s and especially the 1300s. So it shows up early, it's got these hunter gatherer neighbors and then all of those neighbors, virtually all of those neighbors begin to take on the trappings of this way of life. And they do it very, very quickly within just a handful of generations. So that's what's to the east. We're going to head out here to the west, just south of the Black Hills, and then over into, this is the close-up of northeastern, northwestern Nebraska, so South Dakota, here's Wyoming, Black Hills right here, and a geologic formation called the Pine Ridge. The Pine Ridge has kind of two meanings, obviously. The Pine Ridge Reservation is just to the north of us, um, Lakota Reservation. This is, a, I'm using the Pine Ridge in a, in a geologic sense right now. This is the Pine Ridge. It's a beautiful place to work just in passing, which is one of the reasons I went up there. Not the only reason. It was thrust up. There's, it's, this escarpment was thrust up when the Black Hills rose up through the floor of the Great Plains. And as it did that, it pushed up the local aquifer and, and the canyons in the Pine Ridge carry permanent water out of the aquifer. It runs down into the, the White River, which is the main or dr major drainage in here. And you can see the river courses, right? We have the stream courses down here. That's permanent water in a relatively arid landscape, right? So it creates these localized kinds of environments where you know, the floodplain is, is fairly rich and you might have the potential for agriculture. And in fact, back in the 1940s, and there's a little bit of irony in here, when Wadel talked about the 100th meridian, farmers on one side, hunter gatherers on the other, that was in the 1940s. At exactly the same time, his mentor, Asa Hill, who was the director of the Nebraska State Museum at the time, or the Nebraska Historical Society, was digging a site in Shadron State Park. And, it, and Asa Hill was a really good field archeologist, but he didn't show it on this particular excavation. So this dark stain that you see here turns out to be a house floor, um, slightly dug down into the ground, very irregularly shaped and very, very badly documented. The, the, it is said to be a floor about this wide, with a pit this big under it, which means you couldn't have stood on the floor. So it makes no sense at all as one structure. And we just, there just is no answer to this. But we know that there was something built there that was house size and, and in, in some general kinds of ways, kind of similar to these houses to the east. And in other ways was really similar to it. So we have pottery like this, which is, you know, less ornate even than normal Central Plains tradition pottery, but still that globular shape with, with a cord marked exterior. Um, you can find pots like this in all kinds of Central Plains tradition houses. Um, they dug out tons and tons of bison bone, every bit of which they threw away. So we know nothing more about it than that it was there. Um, but they also found direct evidence of maize agriculture, including maize corn, corn cobs, maize cobs, um, only one of which they retained, and bison scapula hose. So not only did they have the products of, of the garden, but they were growing them. They had agricultural tools. This is well beyond um, the 100th meridian, right? Badly documented, barely published until just a few years ago, but everybody kind of knew it was there. And I, so I figured, can't be the only one. There's got to be more. So we'll go look. And it, it was, and I knew, also knew it was a nice place to work, which didn't bother me at all. So we went out and over a number of years walked as many of those per, miles and miles along as many of those permanent streams as we could get access to. This is all private land. 
and um, I would just basically write letters and ask for permission to walk along, you know, along Beaver Creek, along Bordeaux Creek, along Dead Horse Creek, along Ash Creek. And here we are walking along the creeks and get these lovely walks and we spent years becoming really, really expert at not finding um, sites with pottery on them not finding Central Plains, so good at not finding Central Plains tradition sites along the Pine Ridge, um, except for one time. And we actually were told that it was gonna be there. We talked to lots and lots of people, right? Here's one, a globular pot from just south of the White River out of the west end of that distribution. Guy said, oh, you wanna see this pot? And I said, sure. And he took me out to exactly where he found it. He knew exactly where it came from and he knew exactly what we were gonna find when we got there, which was nothing. Um, there, these folks were out there and they were and they were living and leaving pottery but they were just they don't seem to have been out there in any great numbers uh, but there was one other site that we finally finally got to and it was on Bordeaux Creek just east of the Shadron State Park site so Shadron State Park is here Bordeaux Creek is the next major drainage down and that's the King site so this is an aerial view of the King site and you can see Bordeaux Creek running right through here, meandering right through here. And here's the floodplain down here. Plains farmers put their crops in the floodplain because you could till the soil easily without metal tools. It's very hard to break the upland soils, to break the upland turf. And the water table's close to the surface on the floodplain. So that's where fields would be. And they put their houses up above on the turf surface above. So this is a perfect location. Right, there's here's a meander scar from the from the creek. There's soft sediment down in there, close to the water table. Town, little village up here. It's the it's exactly where one of these communities should be. And this is what the site looks like. So you can see it here. Here are the tops of these trees. Right, their their trunks are down in the bottom of of the drainage. So this is the landform with the archaeology on it. There's pottery and there were bone tools and flakes and animal bones scattered over the surface. It drops down this way into that meander. It drops down straight in this direction towards the north, down to where these trees are, and drops down to the side again here easy to fit a handful of small houses up there. It's a perfect site location. And there's a site up there. This is a slight digression. I hate gophers. I don't only hate gophers because the only reason we could see the site was because of gophers. So, so I, I have to say more truthfully that I have mixed feelings about gophers, but I hate these. And this is why there's two le stratigraphic levels at the site. There's a lighter underlying level that's that's you can think of as the bedrock. That's the surface that that it turns out that people lived on, and it's capped by this darker level. And this is what happens when gophers burrow from one into the other. So there's an awful lot of Swiss cheese in the site. Um, that's I, I have to say this both because it lets me show the stratigraphy, but it also makes the site more confusing than I wish it had been. And we'll, I'll show you one or two slides that, that I, where I hope you can see the same patterns that I can see despite the disturbance, because it's an amazing little site. So we dug a lot and I'll show you the things that we found. And we found, um, we found lots of artifacts. We found a couple of storage pits that those bell-shaped kinds of storage pits, although they they're, don't seem to be associated with structures. And then, and we were struggling to find more. So we got out geophysical, we were lucky enough to get the Midwest Archaeological Center from the, from the US Park Service up um, with four kinds of geophysics, all the geophysics that I know of. Um, and the one that worked is, is magnetics. These, there were a variety of reasons why resistivity and conductivity and ground penetrating radar didn't tell us anything useful. It's not, not the fault of the methods, it's the nature of the site. But the magnetics told us a lot. And, and one of the, so this, by the way, all of the, isn't this a lovely pattern? It's like, a, like, a, like a, an MFA thesis project in, in fine art somewhere with those lovely colors. That's what gopher burrows look like when you do magnetics on them. This right here is our excavation in our back dirt. And this right here is what I wanna focus on. We'll come back to this map in a little while, but right here, that turns out, we got a geologist out to confirm it that's where Bordeaux Creek used to be. Bordeaux Creek right now, come back, 
runs over this way, right? It's out here and up here, but back in the day, and as it turns out exactly during the time when people were using this site, it, it looped right around here. And we can actually see that. Finding this out in the magnetics and getting it confirmed by the geologist explains why, for example, when we drop test units in here, we can't find the bottom of that dark layer. It goes down as deep as we can go, uh, as we can physically get with the, with the tools that we have. If we, if we got back home, maybe we could get down to the bottom, but it drops off really steeply. Um, and back in here, it's close to the surface. So this tells us two things. One thing it tells us is that our excavations out in here and down in here, in this case especially, are right on the edge of the creek and are actually on the edge of a steep bank that went down into the creek, which we couldn't tell, right, from the modern ground surface. The other thing that this tells us is that if it looped here and it's not there anymore, the fact that this goes down means that whatever part of the archaeological site was to the west of about here is gone. It's gone forever. It's washed down the creek. And there's nothing we can do about that. And so my initial impression of how perfect the site location was um, based on what I could see today was is misleading. So there's some things missing from the site. And I'm going to argue that despite that, we can tell a lot about what happened here. There's actually two levels at the site. This is just cool. That sediment that I'm calling bedrock it was accumulating in probably up until about AD 900 or 1000 or so because there's a little woodland era bison kill down in there. So there's a whole bison skull right there that has nothing to do with the archaeology I want to talk about. But it does help us to understand some of the, the formation of the, of the surface because we have radiocarbon dates on that. Um, other than that bison kill, though, the archaeology up in there is strikingly Central Plains tradition. Strikingly Central Plains tradition. It's, this is just sort of plain pottery that you could, it's, it's, it's roughly globular, um, but it's totally undecorated. This is clearly globular, modestly more decorated. None of this pottery is very fancy, right? So we've got Central Plains tradition pottery. We've got side notched arrowheads, Central Plains tradition style side notched arrowheads. We'll have, I'll show you some other stuff like this in a little while. We've got diamond bevel knives right here. We've got distinctive sort of knives that you find made out of material that comes out of the Badlands in South Dakota. These are just flat, um, flat slabs of chalcedony that are about a half a centimeter thick. And all you have to do to, to make it into a tool is to just chip the edge right here or chip the edge right there. And these are found all the way from the Badlands all over to the Missouri River. And we've got quite a few of them. We're not very far from the Badlands, but we've got classic diamond bevel knives. One of the things that happens um, when people switch over to uh, from corner notch points, which earlier groups on the Great Plains made to side notch points, is that they start making these what are called shaft abraders. And I think I saw Aaron Hughes's name here. Aaron was one of the people who, who showed that this is true. Um, this groove down the center of this abrader is one of the, you use these in pairs to in order to smooth and to shape the shaft of an arrow. So we know that they were making arrows there. We've got all you know the stuff of everyday life in, in abundance on this site. This, this kind of perforator or all you know for use in any number of crafts, working leather or something like that. This is actually like a crayon. It's a piece of red ochre, and we've got a variety of red and, and fragments of red and yellow ochre. This particular one is a perfect triangle, and it is just barely long enough to hold in your fingers like this, and it looks like it's been used and abraded, ground up, and then flipped and ground up and flipped until it's too small to do much with, and they just pitched it away. Not only do we have this, which is the source of pigment, we have the abrading stones that they ground it on because we have stones that are marked with this same color. And we have a tiny little pot that, that seems to have been a paint pot and it's got the remnants of red paint that matches exactly to this color, right? So we've got people who are, who are getting this kind of, this kind of, of pigment from someplace. Best match we've been able to get sort of informally is Eastern Kansas, which is quite a ways from there. Um, and making paint and, and doing something with it. They're making jewelry and throwing it away. And they've got these bone tubes that were probably a form of jewelry too, right? This is, this is very much the stuff of everyday life from, from, from jewelry and or ornaments to um, painting things to, um, to hunting, to manufacturing tools, to butchering animals um, that they brought in from the hunt. Lots and lots of animal bone from bison down to rabbits and other, other animals. 
clearly hunting fairly close to, to camp. Here's the, the entire lower leg of an ungulate. They just had the whole leg there. That was all articulated and fleshed when they pitched it in the trash. Gathering mussels. If these things came out of Bordeaux Creek, um, look at, you can see the size. Bordeaux Creek was a much bigger creek in the past. We're not sure about that. These could have, they could have brought these in to make beads from, and so they could be from somewhere else. Um, but, but to get that size of a mussel, they were getting it out of a large and fairly free flowing um, body of water. We have grinding stones. This is the upper right hand stone, a mono. We've got a grinding slab, a matati, um, right off laying flat on the ground surface. Processing, um, processing seeds of some kinds. And we have direct evidence, just as they had at Chadron State Park, we have direct evidence of agriculture. We have bison scapula hoe, and you can see it's worn and fractured, broken, the blade broke off um, from heavy use. And this whole edge and all the way around here is polished and rounded off. And we've got tons of charcoal and we've got maize cob fragments and cupules um, and kernels. As they were gardening, they were growing crops. In those, we were right, it's a good floodplain to grow crops and it just wasn't quite working the way we thought it was. So we've got the stuff of the Central Plains tradition, um, but what we don't have yet is a house, right? But we had this, and this is not that light se sediment, dark sediment. This is the dark sediment, but this is an ashy kind of a white layer. And you can see there's a line here. I put the red line in because it's not obvious that you can see that anyone can see there's a line there, but there's a break there and it's patterned. It's really structured. And so we started to chase this because we, you know, house floor, people sometimes plastered house floors on the central plains, not often, but now and then, I'm wondering if that could be what it was. And as we got down into it, it didn't look like that. And it just, it got, first thing, the first thing that it turned into really clearly was trash. That this was a place where they had dumped an enormous amount of trash. And it's really clear that none of this is an anatomical position, right? You've got a bison tail on a bird wing, probably a turkey, um, and a small mammal pel pelvis all jumbled in together. And we took potsherds out of here and we took all kinds of charcoal and, own and all kinds of things. And as we got down into it, it began to be quite structured. So if you cross section it, you can find parts of it where you find this long sloping surface. And that's all black, 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 jet black charcoal in there. And it's got a hard edge right around here, you can see. And you can, if you look just a little bit farther away, you can see it dive down like this. And here's that light sediment, right? So it's dug right down into here in the past, and then it's filled with this dark sediment. This is dark, rich with charcoal. You can see how black that is. And if you look over here, which is just up above this, you see kind of the opposite, right? So this is not dug down. This is light sediment going up, right? So it kind of, right, there's a rise right there. So there's a real structure to this. And when we finally opened it up at the end of our last um, season out there, it turned into this. That is, there is no way in the world that that's a house, right? This is about two meters wide and about four meters long. It's burned all over. You can see how black the base of it is with charcoal. Um, but here's that drop right at this end. This is that edge. This pile of stuff is right there, just beyond it. This hard edge right here is, was ran right along here. And you know, we, we came to it in pieces. So we, it wasn't until the very end that we saw the whole thing. And, I, and my students knew that we just couldn't, we were not figuring out what, what this was. And um, we were sitting around the campfire one night and a friend of mine was out who knows nothing at all about archeology. span He just likes to camp. And so he just came up to hang out with us and he's full of questions. And so he wanted to know what we were finding and you know, we were finding all this stuff and we we're finding pottery. And he said, well, where'd they make it? And I said, just, looks local. I mean, we dug clay out of the, we dug perfectly good clay right out of the floodplain. Um, and he said, well, where'd they fire it? And there's a student who I run into at conferences to this day who laughs at me as soon as he sees me, because he said it was like one of those cartoons, you know, where the light bulb goes off over your head. And it's like, they fired it right in the middle of my excavation. And that's a kiln. It's the only, as far as I know, fully excavated um, ceramic kiln on the Great Plains. But if you open fire pottery, 
these are experimental ones. You dig a hole, you dump the earth right to, back to the side, you light a fire in there, it burns the whole bottom of it, it fills it up with charcoal, you put the pot down in there, you cover it with all of this stuff and you burn it again, you get layers and layers of charcoal. If the pot survives, um, you pull it out and you've got a huge mess, a huge mess, big hole in the ground that's full of ash and charcoal and it is the best place in the world to throw garbage. And that's what they seem to have done at the King site. And these are the last, this is the last right here, the last object that we took out of, out of the bottom of that kiln. Now, I mean, what I'm describing, no houses yet, we'll get to a house in a minute, right? This is a settlement where, where people lived long enough to, to gather clay and make the pots and let them dry and gather all the fuel and then do the firing. And, and when we look through the stuff that we took out of the kiln, there's a remarkable amount of fetal bison bone bison calf in the spring. So, so if you kill a cow that, that's got a fetus, um, you're killing it in the winter. And you probably, so that means that they were filling that kiln with trash during the winter because we're getting the fetal bone from multiple kills. So we can see this extended occupation of people staying in one place and their material culture is almost indistinguishable for most of it, not all of it, but most of it is so close to indistinguishable to these farmers to the east and they're growing crops, they're growing maize right there because we've got the gardening tools and we've got cobs and we've got cupules. Um, and, it's, and it's a little hard to make sense out of uh, in some ways, but it matches back to, um, matches back to the Shadron State Park site. And I wanna, come, I wanna focus on these for just a moment. Besides that, they're, they, it's amazing to actually find the blade of the knife still in the stone handle. This is exactly how we took it out of the ground. We've got the glue that's still in there. And we, we and the, apparently this works best if you wear it on your wrist, dangling in your wrist and you can just grab it that, like that. Um, and we had another handle that came out 30 centimeters away that looks like it broke in antiquity. Um, that was must have been made exactly the same way. And it turns out, um, that they have exactly the same kind of tool or virtually exactly the same kind of tool from the Shadron State Park site. This end socketed, it's in a bison rib, end socketed bifacial knife, just like the, the one that we got and actually the two handles with virtually the same kind of pottery, a little bit more ornate to the extent that this stuff is ornate at all, the same kinds of bone beads coming out. Um, these are the same kind of site, right? We did, we replicated the site, um, but what we didn't have um, are houses we can begin to wonder sort of how this fits in geographically and, and by these small kinds of traits. So handles like this that we get out by the Pine Ridge show up to the south in the Republican River Valley. So this is the, roughly the same kind of handle. If you look to the east and the north, they used bison ribs for handles, right? But they are slotted to the side. And it's these little, these, those kinds of little arbitrary technological choices suggest that, that we might be looking at people who are more Western and Southern rather than in some ways than more Northern and Eastern, even though they have these other similarities. We can begin to tease out um, some of these regional patterns. I also lied just a little bit um, when I said that we it made it look like we had only side notch points because we don't have only side notch points. We've got a mix. We've also got corner notch points and these are not coming out of the, um, the bison kill. They're coming out of the same levels as everything else. So there's these are folks in some who are, to a certain extent are holding on to older styles of arrow point manufacture at the same time that they're adopting new ones. And we have this grinding stone. And I'm, I'm, fine. I'm, I'm pleased to find that I'm still educable because I've learned all kinds of new things since then. But this grinding stone shouldn't be there because Plains farmers from the Kansas River Basin to the north did not use grinding stones to process seeds. They used wooden mortars like this. They used a wooden mortar and a wooden pestle. This is a Mandan mortar. And if you look at a Central Plains tradition house, there's, an ex there's often an extra hole right there. It's not structural. It's totally in the wrong place to be architectural. And it almost certainly held a mortar or something like this. And yet we have grinding stones. Grinding stones show up in hunter-gatherer sites to the west out and across into Wyoming and out into the Great Basin. How old is it? Okay, so we've got the strange mix. How old is it? Right? Farming came to the plains from the east, and it was in the east in the late 1100s. 
and then it's spread in the 1200s and 1300s. We have a little bison kill below, right? It's around AD 800 or so. But I ran six radiocarbon dates. I pulled two dates out of that kiln. I pulled two dates out of both of the pits. I have six radiocarbon dates on annual plants, including maize. And they say that it is still also in the late 1100s. So this site dates to the same time that maize was just, that, that's a central plains tradition. Um, people were just beginning to settle on the other sides of the Great Plains. It makes no sense at all in that way. Now, one last piece of evidence. Go back to this site and we'll look right down here. So here, right, here's all lots and lots of gopher disturbance, but this is not gopher disturbance. This is a, that black is a low magnification reading with a very high magnification reading right in the middle. Low magnification readings are typically holes that have been filled in. High magnification readings are typically fireplaces or rocks and things like that. So we dug down in there. And this is where the gophers come back a little bit. We hit a basin house. And if you look right along there, it's a dark above and light below. And that is a basin house right there. This is a disturbed hearth. It's filled with charcoal. We took out chunks of charcoal the size of my thumb and rocks, probably a wintering. It looks like a winter kind of a hearth where you would heat up rocks so they radiate back heat at night. And you can see the bottom of it right here. That's not a Central Plains tradition house. Um, it's a hunter-gatherer style house from out in Wyoming. These are the kinds of houses that hunter-gatherers out in Wyoming, these kinds of, sometimes these big deep basins, but more often these shallow kinds of open basins, four meters or so across, sometimes bigger, um, sometimes with storage pits, which we didn't find in it, but that may just be because we didn't dig the whole thing. So what have we got? Um, we've got clear evidence of Western connections. We've got obsidian from that must come from Yellowstone Park. We've got uh, in the vicinity of Idaho or Yellowstone. We've got raw material that comes out of Eastern Wyoming. We've got a house style that sits stratigraphically in exactly the same place as all the rest of those of the excavations of any kind that we have at the site sits right at the top of that light level. Um, that looks like a Western Plains hunter-gatherer kind of a house. We've got maize, we've got gardening, we've got pottery that looks to the east. Um, and this, and and we've got um, ochre that probably comes out of eastern Kansas. We want to we want to demonstrate that that's true, but that's our best interpretation. So we've got this tiny little place out in western Nebraska that's actually connected to uh, all the way across the Great Plains, either stylistically or by the movements of objects, um, because people knew each other. And so I want to step back up say what's going on, so just what's going on. And what I think is happening is that we've got people who know what's happening around them and who are thinking about it, maybe trying it out. And what, what these are showing you are, are some probability distributions of radiocarbon dates. It's a rough way of, that people increasingly are using to try and look at general population trends. I don't think it works in detail, or at least I haven't been convinced yet, but I think it works in a general kind of a way. And this particular curve is in the Bighorn Basin in East Central Wyoming. And right there, Pre, just predates the King site and there's a crash in population. And this curve overall shows population increasing when environmental conditions look good and decreasing when environmental conditions look bad, which is not a big surprise to anyone. But the problem is that in this period of time, environmental conditions don't look bad, but it looks, if this measures population, it crashed. If you look down into Colorado to the south of us and you look into the, um, excuse me, um, the Platte River Basin. So the Platte River runs from Denver up towards the Northeast, comes up into Nebraska and runs across and exits and meets the Missouri River out, in, um, out near Omaha. Same period of time, population crashes down there. If you look down into Southern Colorado, at exactly the same time, population increases, right? Radiocarbon dates anyway increase. And if that's a proxy for population, we get opposite trends here and opposite trends between the Arkansas Basin and this. And what this is, what we know the kinds of sites, when we look at the kinds of sites that are being dated down here, they're, they've gotten bigger, the stone, not, these are not big by most people's standards, but they're bigger by local standards, stone foundation houses that are part-time maize, maize horticulturalists. So we see population 
take it as a proxy, population increasing, population decreasing, population decreasing. And if we look at the plains as a whole, as maize farming go, um, hits the plains, how do you get it? Essentially up in Canada, way up on the Northern Plains, the Canadians have shown have very good evidence um, that people were trading for it. They're finding traces of maize in really surprising places where you couldn't possibly have grown it. So it looks as has, like it has to have been traded up there. Down here and across this area, all the way out to the east and as far over as here, people became farmers, at least part-time. But we've got these two areas where it looks like they, they abandoned it, where people seem to, have, these spaces seem to have opened up. And this King site sits right in the middle of all that. It's a lot of weight um, for a small site to carry. I get it. But what I think it looks like um, is a community that, that is just barely beginning to settle down. It's just in the process of making a change. And they know the things that are happening out here and they're connected, right? But the, only, the closest farmers to them at, at this age are right up in here and possibly some down in here. We need a little bit better data to show that that's true. But they're either place, they're a long way from here. But I think this is, the, this is what that first moment looks like when they're eyeing their neighbors or their cousins or their in-laws, which is almost certainly the case, um, and deciding what they're gonna do. And then a few generations later, moving farther east because this whole area empties out. So that's a lot of weight for a little site. Happy, how do I do on, I'm not bad on time either. I'm happy to answer questions. It's too much speculation in there for there to be no questions. Portfin, you're on mute. So. so how many people did actually live at that King site? I would, I could guess, but it would be no more than a guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, my, I would assume that, that it would just be a few families, but see, mm -hmm. we're stuck, right? That if that loop of the, of the stream goes where, it, where the geophysics and where my geologist said it went, mm -hmm. There could be 50 houses that all washed away. I don't. I don't believe for a second okay. that there were, but um, it's you know, that's just this, that's the sort of thing we don't know. Mm -hmm. I have to. I have to give credit to someone. I. I think. Can you see? Can everyone see who the the all the panels on your screen? Not there's right now. The mid, there's one in the middle that says Aaron Hughes, and Aaron is actually oh, yeah, the okay. person. She was my graduate student, and she was actually the person who first identified that house, the one when we finally found it. Um, we, were, we were getting discouraged and, and Erin was digging. And she's good at this. She's really good at this. And she's like, um, I think I found something. <laughs> it's, I think that's exactly <laughs> the words, actually. And in fact, what she had was perfect shot of the edge of, of that basin. Mm -hmm. So um, you have evidence that they lived there for a long time too, right? Well, you know, at least, I think our evidence gives us, a, you know, a, a, an occupation of a year, and I'm not sure that I can that I can pin it for much longer than that. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So just for one season, they planted, built all this for one season. It's, I th I think there's a lot about plains agriculture that we just don't know. Um, and I think people, uh, there's evidence that there's at least one other site where where much more settled people. We absolutely did that. There's a, mm -hmm. in the Nebraska Sandhills. There's a place. Um, there's the thousands and thousands of, or hundreds and hundreds of these little lakes, and it's a it's a bad place to winter because it's hard to build a very substantial house in there. But it's a good place to come in and, and plant crops temporarily, and you can actually see the season of occupation at these sites. Um, mm -hmm. In, in the um, growth rings and the vertebra of fish because they were taking fish out of this lake and they moved in in the spring, stayed there all through the summer and into the fall, and they hunted bison, but they grew maize. The same kind, even better evidence that we've got. They've got stalks and they've got all thrown away in the trash. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, and, and that's it. There's no evidence of any kind of longer term occupation. There's no, they were building what looked like almost like teepees. So mm -hmm. we know that they did this kind of seasonal food production, at least in some places. So I think it's, I think it's plausible. Mm -hmm. But you said you found a lot of trash in that one abandoned kiln, right? Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it sounds like, I don't know how much trash a couple of families can produce in just one year, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I, we have, I'm hoping that the funnel analyst can tell me a little bit more about this. Um, I mean, a, but one bison makes a lot of bone. So, um, so it, it, and we don't know, there's actually, I'm, I'm reasonably certain actually that there's a second kiln there right next to the first one that we, that we nicked the corner of in one of our grid units. And um, I, I don't want to dig another one. <laughs> so we just, and there's no reason to dig another one, but we found exactly the same kind of patterning. They were, they were using bone as fuel, for example. It's a, You know, we see the they call it the Pine Ridge because it's so full of, of trees right now. But ever, you know, in more in more ancient times, fire drove the, that woodland back into those canyons, and so it was much harder to get wood. Um, you can see when it burns, when it occasionally burns now, you can see the trees just vanishing, and so they used a lot of bone as fuel in in the kiln itself. Mm -hmm. and you can see that. And, we, and so there's this notch that we have in the corner of something that's got the same kind of burned bone and the same kind of outline on the edge. And so I think mm -hmm. there's a second when I, I think, which might suggest that they were there longer, actually, mm -hmm. it could be a couple of years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a question in the uh, chat. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Yes, I can. I'm sorry. I do this to my students too in class. And I miss it. Any evidence of maize through trade of during the same time period, the Canadians, have been um, doing a lot of work looking at sites that are a little bit older than this and they come right up through time into the 14 and 1500s. And they're, they're looking at pottery and grinding stones and things like that. And they're finding evidence way out in Alberta of maize. And they've had, they found three kinds of evidence and one kind of evidence turns out to be very, very bad. They're finding maize starch and um, um, That's otherwise known as cornstarch, um, which is all over the world, including all the gloves that people in, in laboratories wear. Uh -huh. So finding cornstarch on archaeological, they published it all and then they went kind of oops. But, but what they're also finding is maize pollen and maize phytolites. And they're showing up on grinding stones and things like that at bison kill sites like the Gull Lake site um, in Saskatchewan and, and Alberta. And, um, so yes, they're absolutely trading it up there. And that's, that was one of the staples that, that people, that farmers, like people from the towns that I showed back at the very beginning, traded to their hunter-gatherer neighbors. They traded maize and they traded beans and dried beans and squash out onto the far, far out onto the Great Plains. And these are the, these, the, this Canadian work is the first time people have been able to see that in the deeper past. Mm -hmm. Do you know if the Canadians are doing any isotope work or any other geochemical work to try to trace the growth region of the maze? Um, not that I know of. Not that I know of. One of the problems is that it's all carbonized, so I'm not quite sure what gets left. Mm -hmm. Should I add that there's a there's a well, there's a Canadian archaeologist here, Jack Brink, who wants to know um, he's sipping, sipping a scotch, which is in character completely he wants to know if we found fire red and earth underneath because he would expect it to oxidize and I would have expected it too if it had sediment in it that oxidized but we took the samples of the dirt that that light colored sediment um, and then we took samples of the dark colored sediment and we threw them in a fire um, and then we pulled them out and the light colored sediment doesn't oxidize it just hmm. doesn't but the dark colored sediment does oxidize It turns bright orange. So I almost, I, I know it occurred to me that somebody might ask this question. I have a photograph, but I'm not going to take time to look for it right now. Um, the fact that the dark colored sediment does oxidize, but isn't oxidized and it caps everything makes it really clear that it came in after all this activity was over. Because if it was there when fires were burning, it would be RNG red. Um, mm -hmm. But that light colored stuff just doesn't. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions? I don't want to monopolize this here. No. I do have more though. 
I'm not sure if I, I, this happens in my, my classes where there's too many people. This is wonderful that there's so many people here. This makes me really happy. Um, I can't tell if people are like raising hands or if it's not showing up in the chat. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we could do that. You all have the reaction button. So if you want, you can raise hands like here. And uh, then I just recently learned that if I don't click on it as the host, it will stay on there the entire time. Right. So. But, but my student, I kept waiting for the student to ask a question. <laughs> the other thing that students do is, is they, they don't put their cameras on as, and so they can pretend that they're in class. Because right. So if I can ask another question, yeah. Um, yeah. I was wondering, I know this is an iffy topic because, um, you know, of the cultural um, restrictions and so on, but I wonder one way to tell that people have been in a place for a long time is that you find graves, right? So have you found any evidence of graves? I know that you might not want to dig them, but have you found evidence? No, not a hint. There were, very briefly, we thought that we might have found um, some finger bones mm -hmm. scattered. It's not unusual to, I mean, we, when our people die, they go into the grave very quickly. I mean, these were societies that, that we know where the dead state present and we, we multi-stage burial ceremonies over years and, and people would do secondary interments. A lot, most of these early groups in, in this part of the world did ossuary burials or um, a little bit farther to the east, they built small small burial mounds with, with these collective burials or collective bundles of bones. So the, the, the dead were present in, in the world of many people. For quite a while, uh, yeah. burying everybody, and we thought we might have found a little bit of that, but it, it turns out that um, we were not. There were, there were carnivore bones, so we, mm -hmm. uh, we haven't. There, there are there are burials not far from where we are that are a little bit older than us. So, so if these plains farmers, if they move, they will actually bring their ancestors with them in bundles of bones. It's these more mobile groups that definitely do. Oh, yeah. the, what the, when they settle down longer, permanent settlements kind of a relative thing within these communities. When we look at these houses, they, the more substantial houses to the east, they, they don't often show a lot of evidence of repair. These are all, but they're all built organics. These are all wooden posts that they're driving down into the ground. So mm -hmm. eventually they rot and they start to weaken. And so you either rebuild the whole house or you move and and most people see a relationship between a, a fallow period from dryland farming um, and, the, and the lifespan of the house. And it becomes, if you, if you plant in the floodplain the way these folks seem to have done, you end up with these long linear fields. So that mm -hmm. if you've got fallow, in acres and acres of fallow and acres and acres in use, scattered in these long stripes, it becomes easier to move the house than it does once you've got to repair it than it does to move. And then it does to rebuild. And so that people talk about a cycle of movement along these kinds of drainages, um, which makes the notion of permanence a, a sort of a, a dicey thing. But that said, throughout the northern part of this distribution of farmers, it's collect we, what we see are collective burial. And so people would, would apparently either bury and then disinter and bundle or expose on a scaffold and then bundle or something like that. Um, whoever dies, and then all at once, there would be the bury, a bur collective burial of all at once in an ossuary or under a small mound. So they have to have been transported with their relatives at these points. Oh, there's another question. Yes. Oh, there's another Another, it was another question from Jack. It says, do I think they were growing corn at Clooney or just trading for it? Clooney is a, a site up too far north. Um, and my answer is, I don't know. Hmm. Not Canadian, I don't have to know that. <laughs> we found the handle of a knife that was a broken blade that was in the adhesive. I, I don't know what the, what the, um, what it is yet. We have, I've been talking to people about the best way to, to figure it out. And I'm just not sure. There's a lot of uh, 
I've got more questions than I have money to answer the questions with at the moment, um, which is sort of always true. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's on the list. And I'm thinking about that broken um, gardening tool that you mm -hmm. found, right? And it's well-worn and yes. so on. Um, that also looks to me as if they spent some time. Of course, I don't know how easily bison bones break down. Yeah. I, I don't think we have good evidence on how quickly you have to replace them, but mm -hmm. there's no question that, they, that they're not that durable. You find them by the, there's a, there's a project I'm working on right now at the other opposite end of the state even we're looking at collections that people made in the 1930s from this site. And even with those kinds of collection standards, there are hundreds of fragments of these things. Oh, yeah. So they went through quite a few. Do you have any idea who did the actual gardening? Because I'm, I'm teaching a course on Roman women right now. So mm -hmm. this is kind of uppermost in my mind. Who does what and how is work gendered? Yeah. Almost everything that, that plains archaeologists say in detail about, um, about agriculture on the Great Plains comes in one way or another from Gilbert Wilson's work on the Hadassah, um, and particularly a woman named Buffalo Bird Woman. And, there's a, um, and in, those, in these very recent communities, the, her really detailed information and other kinds of ethnographic information on the tribes say that women did the garden. Oh, yeah. Now, whether, I mean, those are, I get nervous about extending those kinds of things too far back in, in time. Buffalo bird women and Hidatsa lived in towns of hundreds of people. And so you, it's one thing to, to look at a, at a gender division of labor like that, where you've got lots of labor to divide. And it's quite another if you've got two families living nearby. And I suspect that the, the there's a lot, I would, I would expect a less rigid development you know, that kind of division of labor. Mm -hmm. so you see the same kind of thing on the American frontier. You know, frontier women, working class frontier women hunted and did all the things and men helped them do all the things and because you, you just didn't have a choice. So, mm -hmm. but the Gilbert Wilson's work, it's, it's all, it, the Smith, all the Smithsonian volumes these days are, are free can download them from the Smithsonian. It's, it's this really richly detailed, detailed discussion of maize agriculture among the Hadatsa and all the different strains that they grew and, and a lot of information about planting and harvesting and processing and things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I got a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you said all these tribes knew each other. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming if they all knew each other, they all they were all. This was like a peaceful region because you always hear that some tribes were more warrior-like. At, at this period of time, there's not a lot of um, a lot of evidence for conflict in this area. It really varied in time and space. The mid 1100s, um, if you look north up into South Dakota along the Missouri River. People were building these towns with 30 and 40 houses in them and building walls around them. And there's a, there's a truly graphic um, sort of vignette of violence in a site called the Fate Fulton site that probably was close to contemporary with this site. So it, it varied a lot in space. Mm -hmm. We also don't know what kind of languages they were speaking, right? Um, but it, it would be a guess. There are places where I think we do. Um, mm -hmm. Most people would see the Central Plains tradition groups as, as Kedowin speakers, just as ancestral to the Pawnees and Arikaras. Mm -hmm. Whether these Western these people on the Western edge were necessarily a part of that language, group, that, that feels like a stretch to me. But could they them. easily communicate with each other, the different tribes? We don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, we see objects moving back and forth, and, and we see lots of, of similarities of artifact style. And it's hard to imagine that we didn't have things like that, uh, that, 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 didn't, that, that didn't entail communication and interaction. Mm -hmm. right. I'm sorry, no, this, the hoe did not actually, did not itself have, have kernels on it. Um, we found the hoe discarded and broken and used, discarded in the trash. But in 
in, elsewhere in the trash, the, the, um, the woman who, who looked at all of our charcoal said that there are kernels and the copules, which is what the kernel sits in, and the cob fragments. Um, is that from the people changing from hunter-gatherers to farmers and finding different uses for material? The, I th I'm thinking back to hunter-gatherer sites. You don't find bison scapulas used in the same ways in, in pre- or agricultural sites that you do in these, in these with, if you're not tilling a garden, um, you wouldn't use the, the scapula as the same in the same way that you would if you are tilling a garden, if that makes sense. So this is this is a new technology. It's a new use of technology. So it's something they they would have learned how to do um, from whoever wherever they got the seeds that they were planting. Are they using the scapula because there's simply no wood around that they could use instead? To I think make bone, bone, bone is more durable. Oh, I see. And it's naturally shaped. If they take the, when they cut the scapula out, if you take, there's a spine on the back, and if you cut it, get the spine off. And there's more than one way that they attach them to the, to the handle. Um, but it, it holds up better than, than wood. And, and yes, it's also true, I think, that, um, that there's ju there just wasn't that much wood around. Another question. Life expectancy change. I'm trying to, I'm thinking back to the, what happens, I'm not sure that we know is, is the answer. There's a, for one thing, there, there has not been, um, Plains, Plains bioarchaeology truly lacks synthesis, which is really unfortunate. Um, the, People who, who should have been doing more synthesis have not done it, um, but it's also true that that there's that when you get into agricultural periods, there's enormous fluctuations in what look like life expectancy and um, child mortality and things like that. What typically happens when when we talk about longer average lives in these kinds of circumstances, what we usually mean is fewer children dying. Um, it's not that people are, once you get past childhood, you live about the same length of time, but what you're, the, those averages, ref, the changes in those averages reflect people's ability to, to bring their children through the, their youngest years, which um, under many circumstances are really difficult times. And so, so it's a little bit misleading to talk about increased average lifespan um, when what we're really talking about is higher and lower rates of child mortality. Infant, infant mortality. Uh, oh, do you have a question, right? Yeah, I, I have a. I don't want to be too much of an environmental determinist, oh, but I'm curious if, if you've looked at all at, at climatic patterns in the 12th century, because uh, you know. I, one of the beauties of having Zoom talks is as you're talking, I'm looking at whether, you know, I'm looking at some models. So I'm, I'm going through the data very, very quickly. Yeah. And I see that uh, it looks like, in the, at least in the Colorado Plateau, there was a, an above average anomaly and then it dropped very quickly in the, at the- mid 1100s. Yeah. It's a horrific drop in the mid 1100s, yes. Yeah. And that episode of violence in South Dakota that I mentioned dates into that, that drought interval in the mid 1100s. This, you know, the, I'm quite confident that those radiocarbon dates say late 1100s, but there's actually a plateau for the, those of you who really like radiocarbon dating know, there's a plateau in the 1100s that means that, that makes it hard to narrow down. Um, I can't see it being in the first part of that plateau because it isn't anywhere else in the world around it. That may not be true. It's too, it, seems, uh, it seems implausible to me that, you would, that it would be out west at that earlier part, that it makes it's reasonable enough that it would be there in that later part, which would put it just after um, this, this drought. And I think that drought was pan-regional. It was one of the big ones. Um, right, because if, if they're farming in the floodplains and the water dries up, then you know, their agricultural technology dries up and yeah. they move on. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, we might move east. Although this, you know, having this be um, out of the local aquifer 
is it ameliorates some of that. But I think it would just post-date that. I, mean, I can't guarantee it, but I think it just- Well, that could explain in your late 1100s then. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Can we assume the Central Plains farmers also want to win? Yes, there's a, there were what we would call woodland people all over the Central Plains. So there's sites with a related pottery that it's, it's, a, it, it's the same woodland pots that you would find across most of Eastern North America, these conical, also typically cord marked pots all over the, um, the Central Plains. And there's a, they, they're fairly clearly related. Um, that's that pottery style is related to these to the Central Plains tradition um, style, and there are a few places where they where people seem to never have made the shift to food production. So in south in southeastern Kansas, for example, there's a there's a set of communities where their their pottery changes a little bit, but their architecture still looks like a woodland style of architecture, and and their projectile points remain mostly woodland style projectile points, and there's no evidence of maize and and, and yet there they are with radiocarbon dates that bring them right up into the 12 and 1300. So there seems to be much more of a mosaic of set of changes. Um, hmm. And, sorry. There's another good uh, question here from yeah. Olivia. I think that there's, think a that there's a technological correlation between the bison, bison scapula mm -hmm. and the wooden grinding stone you found. Um, I'm not sure the grinding stone made out of wood. The grinding stone is stone. It's a it's a sand, it's a block of sandstone that's abrasive to that you use to grind. So, I'm not. I think she's she's probably uh, referring to the mortar that you talked oh, about. Oh, oh, oh! I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I. Th and this is new. This is one of these I, these little things that plains archaeologists have, have sort of. We haven't paid enough attention to, and I've only lately learned about these wooden mortars. So I guess it's a rabbit hole that I went down last fall and, and actually just have a paper coming out about it. It literally just came out last week. Um, I think it has to do with, with the need, with differences. It's, a, it's partially a cultural difference. It's an Eastern kind of a thing to do. Wooden mortars were used really widely across the Eastern woodlands, but I think it, it also reflects that I think, and I, I need somebody to really, who knows a whole lot about maize, which is not me, um, to, to confirm this in some way or to test it in some way, um, that there's different kinds of maize and that a lot of the maize that was grown on the Great Plains is flint maize. It has a really hard shell and um, it's hard to grind. And you have to, what people did was soak it in water, often water with alkali in it um, called nixtamalization. Hmm. which also improves the, the, the nutrient composition of the maize. And then you can pound it and more easily. In this, if you look at recipes for, for making hominy in the Southwest, what they talk about is soaking the maize and then brushing it off with your fingertips. Rain is nodding, so you know more about this from, from the Southwest, right? But it means it gets soft enough that you don't need to, to to work very hard to shell the maize. When you read the same recipes from the Eastern US, they talk about doing it and then pounding it. And I think you need a mortar to pound it in. And mm -hmm. these wooden mortars seem to have been, the ones in the Central Plains tradition houses are much bigger. The, the holes in the ground that, we, that people think held mortars are bigger than that mortar I had a picture of. So mm -hmm. recipes cooking seems to have changed in ways that we just don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. What else did they eat apart from meat and fish and mice? I mean, that doesn't sound like a very balanced diet to me. I mean, we got we have rabbit bone and and they apparently ate freshwater mussels, which um, oh yeah, mm. tastes mostly like mud. Um, I am told I have um, not, I've not steeled myself to actually try it, but they they taste like their substrate, which is mostly mud, and um, so they collected those. We have. Um, there's turkeys all over the Pine Ridge now. And we've got the wing of a bird that looks turkey-sized, um, bison, deer, antelope. So there's quite mm -hmm. an array of animals. The, the charcoal that we've got has some other seeds in it, but it's a little hard to tell if they came in with um, as fuel 
or not our chuckles kind of dominated by by things like like pine because of the kiln um, mm -hmm. so an array of an array of, of wild seeds in addition to to maize and maize would, probably was a pretty small part of the diet would they have planted anything beyond maize there's evidence for not we don't have anything else um, there's evidence in other plains village sites other contemporary um, other contemporary sites of squash um, beans came in a little bit later they grew sunflowers and there's native north american domesticates things like domesticated chinopods and other kinds of species that are um, that show up it, to the east we have my the botanist the ethnobot paleo ethnobotanist we have all these long specializations um who went through my stuff did not see it did not tell me there was any of that stuff in there hmm. i think we have one more question here in the chat this is jack asking again um, <laughs> it's hard to believe they were just true it's hard for me to believe they're just true also are there more king sites to be found i'm sure that there are um, i think there's there's a couple of, of issues that are involved here and one of them is um, suggested by our magnetics results that, that if the streams are are all as active as bordeaux creek it is a fluke that that the piece of it that that we found was still there mm -hmm. would not it, it would only have had to have, have changed its erosional pattern just a little bit to have taken out that whole site and it could be that these streams are moving around and we, you know we we see the landscape as stable and you know we had these horrific floods in the midwest of the site the place where we've been working you know, in eastern nebraska this 11 feet of water came down the niobrara river when a dam broke you know, and, the, and these rivers move around and then we put them back. We spend tens of millions of dollars putting these things back. And who knows the next time they're going to move or how far. But that's, you know, because we have property and we have highways and we have things that have to stay exactly where they are. But they've mm -hmm. done that for thousands of years. And so it's, it is entirely possible that there were many of these sites that have just been destroyed and we just haven't found them. Um, the yeah. other the other thing is that all every square inch of the, the places where these sites are likely to be is, is privately owned. There's a there's public land, but it is out in that part of the world, governments own land that nobody else wants. And so um, I know of, there was a big site that may or may not have been the same age as this that sat right on the White River that um, that they land leveled away and they, archaeologists looked at it and we went out and found we found the right place and we couldn't find a flake I mean, we couldn't find anything they were really thorough in what they did and i got i got more yeses than noes but i got a lot of noes when i asked for permission so it's a, you can't tell what's out there until until people let you look or will talk to you about it but the collectors who we've talked to say that they don't find a lot of pottery so i'm sure there's others but um I don't know how many. We sure looked hard. Maybe farther to the east, there, there's folks. That... The next Beaver Creek, um, where we were able to look a little bit, um, but got got some no's that I wish had been yeses. We might be able to find more of these sites too. Yeah, I imagine the one of the tricks would be to use the the signature now that you have from the magnetic anomaly of the kiln and see if you can find additional kilns. That would be, but the, you've got to, I've got to have the same permission to, to get on land to, you know, to, to yeah. take that out. Um, I mean, that's, um, that's uh, sticks out in magnetics. Like, I mean, you no, know, you couldn't miss that, um, but you've got to have permission to walk the land. And we've got the work, the site that we're on now, the, I mean, walking it, the way with, with those two sensors that you carry in a, on your chest, that's great, but it's un, ungodly slow. And you can't cover a lot of acreage. We've, there's now a, um, a 16 sensor array that you can pull behind a, um, behind a little ATV. And um, 
we did 40 acres in two and a half days <laughs> on another site. Um, so I, I watched the people who know how to do this stuff. So that kind of thing, that's what we all need. <laughs> We all should have our own private 16 array magnetic radiometer. We can just mag do the entire world. Um, and we would, if you could do whole floodplains in, you know, if you had a couple of weeks, but then you'd have to have permission and you know, hopping fences is just not something you do. Um, Well, I think this was a really very lively discussion and a very interesting talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, really enjoyed this. I'm glad this uh, was the start of uh, our first um, revived lecture series, I would say. So, uh, and I'm just amazed how well it went. We were really worried that it wouldn't. So. Uh, having all experienced uh, some snafus just trying to teach with Zoom, but this went really, really well. So thank you so much for an interesting talk about a very interesting area of this country. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. It's been wonderful to have so many people too. It's good to see you, Aaron, and good to hear from you, Jack. All right. So, thank you so much. Yes, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Okay. Mary. Raina, thank you for doing all this, all the setup stuff. I really appreciate oh, it. I'm you're, sorry. You're... My organization is, all, is usually better than it was episodically and you just kind of got caught in, in some disorganization, but it all worked, right? It all it worked. Did. It, it did. It did. Yes. Yeah. So thank thank you, for, you. Thank you for putting up with me. Oh, you're welcome. It was a pleasure to meet you finally, you know. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go have a glass of wine. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Yes, thank you, thank you so thank much. You questions too, they're really good questions. This was fun. I'm really, really glad that I did this. So. Oh, oh, good. And, and being your 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 very first one, you know, it yeah. was it was a success. I yes. would not have known had you not said that. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. All right. Well, Bye. Thanks again, and you take care. You too. Bye. Bye. Just seem as busy as anyway. As yeah. Always. Yeah. I kind of wondered, you know, whoops, I can't stop it. <laughs>